Okay, I think we, we can start. Alex, is it okay for you if we start now? Or? Okay, so welcome uh, everyone for this uh, second edition uh, of this online uh, colloquium. Uh, so it's, it's really a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Alex Christia, who is a CNRS uh, Director of Research, and also she's uh, the Director of the LSCP uh, Laboratory at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure. So Alex is, uh, is now very well known for a lot of works, uh, I would say the interface between cognitive sciences, linguistic, machine learning. She also uh, received a lot of awards for her research. And uh, recently she received the McDonnell Award in uh, Human Cognition. And also uh, she's a recipient of the CNRS uh, Bronze Medal. So I think she's going to speak about uh, unsupervised learning uh, for, for children. Uh, so Alex, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind words. I'm actually very, very happy to be here and I look forward to all of your questions. Don't hesitate to interrupt me. I prefer to know that people are following me. And um, since for some of you, this might be perhaps the first time you look into uh, child-directed data, um, speech data, all of your questions are welcome. Um, during the talk, preferably, but if you want also contact, to contact me by email later, I'd be happy to uh, talk about potential collaborations because we've barely started scratching the surface of this topic. So let me start with a little bit of a motivation of why it might be interesting to look at babies. Um, as I'm sure you're aware of, uh, there is a lot of talk right now about how artificial intelligence might be catching up with human intelligence and certainly surfacing human intelligence on uh, task after, after task. Um, one thing that was very salient to us, uh, now all news in 2016, was the announcement by Microsoft that they had developed a system that transcribed from raw speech that had a level of transcription that was uh, basically similar to a human level. And so that was a big um, shock at the time. Um, in more recently, we've seen uh, lots of interest in, in, in games. Um, and so these are just a couple of examples of the many domains in which artificial intelligence seems to be catching up or surpassing human intelligence. And so whenever I see things like this, I always think of Turing, um, who's one of the forefathers of cognitive science and who had lots of interesting thoughts that are relevant even today. So for instance, um, in one of his papers, he writes, we may hope that machines will eventually compete with men in all purely intellectual fields, but which are the best ones to start with? And so he says, he talked about these two options. One of them is a very abstract activity, like the playing of chess. Um, and the alternative that he talks about at that point is uh, teach the machine to understand and speak English. And then he goes on to say a little bit more. And, and he says, well, this process could follow the normal teaching of a child. Notice the, the use of the word teaching um, things would be pointed out and named, etc. He goes on to say that it's unclear which of the two choices would be um, appropriate in this particular paper. In some papers, he would say, well, we should start, other people have also said, we should start with language, which is the easier one. Chess will be too difficult. Well, it turns out that maybe that's not the right inference to do. Um, when we actually start trying to figure out language, there's a few things that we need to do. One of them is discovering and classifying sounds. Um, so to start with, a, with a, uh, I just realized that you might actually not hear my sound if I play it. Let's see. If I play a sound, can you tell me if you hear it? No one heard this, that, right? No, we don't hear the sound. No, no. Yeah. Let me see. Way. Let's try. The, the sound will be less good without the, the headphones, but you might hear it. At least you, I, it's just a few slides where I have examples. Okay, let's try that again. So these are two examples, two extracts from, um, from recordings I did during my thesis. And so this is an American mom talking to her five month old. Um, and so they're both taken from utterances that are close by. The first one just says, <coughs> just to make it louder. Oh dear. Okay. And then the second one. Tick the 
Okay, so what's uh, obvious to us is that boo and peekaboo there are basically the same thing. Um, what might be less obvious but becomes obvious when you're looking at these um, visual representations um, is the fact that they're actually not identical, they're far from identical. Um, and so we see lots of differences uh, here in terms of the actual uh, pronunciation. Nonetheless, for us adults, boo and peekaboo are uh, basically very similar things and they might be the same word, at least the same word form that's repeated in these two contexts. So one of the things that kids need to do is find these basic units like words and sounds and then put them together and realize that this, this bit and this bit, even though they don't look exactly the same, they're both examples of a B. They're both examples of this sound, B. And similarly, this O and this O, which don't sound, sound the same because they also have noise overlapped with it. Here we have noise at the beginning, here we have noise at the end. The child is supposed to actually ignore that noise, throw it away, um, and realize that these are two examples of O. Um, it turns out that when we look at babies, they also do other things. Um, in particular, uh, even from a very um, young age, they start associating meaning with some of these forms. So for instance, perhaps they might find out that peekaboo is something where you go and you cover your, your face. Um, and that's a, a, an action that goes with that, um, with that word or with that sequence of words, depending on how the child um, imagines them. Actually, in the rest of this talk, I will not talk about meanings, but it's just to um, emphasize that the child is actually doing all of these tasks, which are conceptually quite different, finding minimum units, clustering them, and then maybe associating across modalities. Um, and there's a lot of previous evidence on how, on what babies do. Uh, we know that uh, even before six months of age, um, they are able to discriminate sounds. Um, what I'm showing you here comes from MetaLab, which is a, which is a meta-analysis uh, platform that we created with colleagues at Stanford. Um, and this shows that infants even before one year of age show a significant uh, ability to discriminate vowel sounds um, and to pull out words from running speech. Not shown here are results from their ability to tie up uh, word forms with meanings, because in this talk I won't talk about meaning so much. But clearly they do all this even before they're six months of age. Um, this is too early to be purely supervised because most parents you talk to, except if they've read these studies, actually think that babies at six months don't understand very much. It's not purely supervised, in part for that, but also in part because parents don't go and check that the child's B category, the sound B category, has the label B. So at least based on that, we know that babies are actually doing this uh, process of the acquisition with some kind of unsupervised mean. What's important to bear in mind also is that although we believe, like uh, perhaps Turing, um, that we go about the room pointing things to uh, the child and naming this very explicitly. Um, I've been studying acquisition in other cultures where actually talking to a child is relatively rare. And these instances of picking up a, an object and then pointing at it and naming it are basically non-existent. The child is supposed to pick up their language on their own um, without so much as, uh, assistance from um, others around them. And language acquisition happens there anyway. Um, What's interesting when we start looking at across cultures also is that uh, not only do babies are, you know, succeed in, in acquiring language uh, with unsupervised means, but also they do it with a lot less data than what we um, are actually feeding machines today in a, most of the time in a supervised manner. And so the numbers I'm showing you here come are just a part of a bigger um, data uh, review that I did looking at published um, analyses. And they show the, an estimate of the number of hours that infants, um, that humans have accumulated up to 10 years of age, um, uh, converted into number of words. And this, um, I hope, shows you the amazing diversity in human experiences. So we see kids from Chimane backgrounds where uh, childhood speech is very uncommon, might only get about um, 10 hours of, of uh, uh, um, sorry, 10 million words experience. Um, whereas kids who are growing up in an American 
household that's uh, where parents are highly educated might get um, a lot more than that. Nonetheless, these two are a lot um, smaller than what we actually have to feed machines today. And so the question that a baby robot might ask, you know, a baby AI is, um, I have access to the entire English Wikipedia, I have access to so many resources, what can babies, human babies have, what can they possibly have that I don't? And so this is something that I've been asked in the past, um, can you tell me whether there's something that's in the input that babies have um, that facilitates their acquisition? So that's the question that we're going to ask today. We're going to uh, start asking questions. How is the input that we provide machines that need so much input and that actually most often need it in a supervised manner, is that input different, qualitatively different from the input that kids get? And so the answer is obviously yes. You can see here the comparison between a Wikipedia extract and an extract from a well-known database of child-centered um, input um, in the childless extract. Uh, you see that phrases are much shorter, um, there are many more of them, there's more lexical repetition and so on and so forth. Um, and so this, this comparison is so obvious that it's actually pointless to look at it. But we can ask uh, a slightly more interesting and subtle question. When you compare child-directed speech and adult-directed speech, so that is speech that's addressed to an adult by an adult, do we see these big differences? You can imagine that in both of these cases, you will see some informal speech um, and you will see communication pressure from just talking um, uh, in an everyday setting that will impose and will uh, generate some similarities across these two registers. And so perhaps this is a better question to ask. When adults talk to children, do they do things that will facilitate acquisition? And here, even in this case, we see some repetition, we see um, shorter phrases, we see uh, basically a lot of um, saying the same thing with slightly, slightly different way, in slightly different ways. And so um, these particular differences between child and adult direct speech, and so for the rest of this talk, I might sometimes say CDS and ADS. I hope that's not confusing, uh, but CDS stands for child directed, Adult, uh, ADS for adult directed. So these are cases, um, all, both are speech uh, that's, that's produced in an informal setting. The only difference is who it's addressed to. And that's going to be the difference that we're going to look at here. So when you look at CDS and ADS across cultures, you do find these differences. There are shorter phrases and more repetition when uh, someone is talking to a child versus when they're talking to an adult. And so a question we might ask, is it easier to learn sounds or words from child-directed and adult-directed speech? So the data for the whole of this talk will be drawn from child surrounding speech. So that speech that was recorded uh, from the point of view of the child, and so it's part of their natural environment. And we'll split it into two kinds. The part that's actually addressed to the child, that people are talking to the child, so that's the child-directed speech, and the parts that address to adults around the child. So that's adult direct speech, it's not addressed to the child. And we'll throw away anything else that's not in these two categories. And so the question we're going to ask is, is it the case that it's potentially easier to learn from child direct speech than adult direct speech? Is child direct speech better input, facilitating acquisition? I'll try to, whenever I can, I will try to uh, answer this at a formal level. When that's not possible, uh, we will look at some more, so I will uh, show you when, when this is necessary. Okay, so throughout this talk, I will be talking about one specific corpus in part so that it's easier, but when we have our results, I will refer to them. Uh, so this particular corpus was collected in a lab, um, and so infants were um, about two years of age, um, and the adult uh, representing the adult direct speech uh, was the experimenter. So it was the mother talking either to a child or to the, uh, the experimenter. And the reason why we use this corpus is because the acoustic quality of the corpus is excellent and the annotation has been amazing and very careful um, and it covers both the sound and the word level. So that's why this corpus is particularly useful to look at possib the possibility that learning sounds and words is easier from child-directed than adult-directed speech. 
Um, I will try to talk about five studies. I know it's a lot, so I'll <laughs> try to move fast. In none of these studies do I talk about any kind of meaning. Everything is resolved at the acoustic or um, I will call phonological, so abstract level. Um, throughout my studies, I will go from something that's not at all realistic to something that's very realistic and probably quite close to what the, the baby is doing. So let's go through. We're going to try to test this hypothesis that it's actually easier to learn sounds and words from Chandler speech. Um, the first I could have been um, classifying sounds, but of course this is trivial. Uh, if I have a letter B, I know it's a letter B and not a letter P. So that's uh, doing sound classification um, with abstract representation is trivial. So our first step would actually be try to uh, classify words um, based on their abstract representation. So now imagine that you have words that are represented by their orthography, right? So there is no need to uh, figure out which sounds are which. We have the actual, um, we have it actually written out. And when I say word discrimination, I just mean telling words apart, I, uh, word forms apart, so I don't mean anything about me. There's no meaning involved. I just mean is poo and be different. And they should be different because, you know, they have different letters. So nonetheless, um, the question that we ask in this first study seems fairly trivial, but the idea is the following. Give a perfect cementation into words so that the idea is um, if, I, if, you have a, if you have a stream where you, words are separated by spaces, as they are when, when we look at written text, so that's, uh, we assume that you can separate words with these spaces, and given perfect recognition of all sounds, so we see them written out as they were intended, how easy it is to discriminate or to uh, separate different words. And so the intuition in this context is that if caregivers, if mothers try to promote word learning, they should avoid sound, words that sound very similar. Even though for us, telling the, the letter E and U apart is trivial, you can imagine that for babies it might be um, difficult. So if most of the word is similar and one letter is different, then that's more difficult to discriminate than if every letter is different. So as a reminder, we're not looking at the acoustics here, we're just looking at the representation. So it's the intended form. And the way we measure how similar or how distinct words are is via their normalized eddy distance. So basically, how many of these letters should I change to turn one word into the other? Um, what we find in this case um, is that indeed it's the case that words that are in childhood speech, the words, that, the word forms that are used in childhood speech, tend to be more different from each other than words that uh, occur in adult direct speech. So each one of the points you see here is one adult, so one mother in the experiment. There's 22 of them. Um, and so, for instance, for this mother, we find that on average, um, her, uh, I, her child direct speech words um, were a lot more distinct than her adult direct speech words. Um, so that's what this, um, this difference uh, indicates. Now, when we did this study, we thought, OK, well, that's a point for child direct speech. It seems that words should be easier to learn because they're more distinct. They have more letters on average that are different between them. But we also realized looking at the corpus that um, this is Japanese and as in, as in English, we have lots of words that are onomatopoeia. So these are words that represent kinds of uh, sounds or um, experiences. And so they sound a little bit funny. So we noted things like uh, there was a little choo-choo train and so mothers would go choo, 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 choo. Okay, so that's a word, right? And it's really distinct from anything else you might say, right? Um, and so we thought, well, what happens if we remove all of this onomatopoeia? When you remove it, the advantage for each other's speech actually goes away. Um, and that's in part, it could be specific to Japanese, given that the advantage could be specific to Japanese because it has lots of these onomatopoeia. Nonetheless, we'll count this as a win for child direct speech. It is the case that if we had perfect access to words, then it would be easier to learn the vocabulary because the words are more distinct between each other, from each other. So in the second experiment, we are actually going to look at sounds and now we're going to look at a concrete representation. That means we don't have access to the letters. We just have access to their acoustic, their physical representation. So in this case, 
Remember, these are the boo and peekaboo we saw at the beginning. The task that, um, that uh, the learner is supposed to be doing here is realizing that, that the sound, the, the, this representation behind here is different from these two. So the P is different from B, but they don't have the letters, right? They just have the sound. Um, and I call it classifying because I, I assumed that um, they're just, they are just in this clustering stage. They need to cluster things together and, and actually end up with clusters that are different for, for P and for B. So in this case, we're going to assume perfect segmentation into sounds. Again, we take the sentence and we put the boundaries between the sounds exactly where they should be. So in, in the case of, the, of this corpus, it, it was done by a, by a phonetician. And we ask ourselves, given this perfect segmentation into sounds, how easy is it to discriminate between different sounds or put otherwise to cluster them together in the right clusters? But here we, we just uh, assume that we have the, the segmentation um, uh, all done. So we don't try to cluster them. We just look at the informational properties of this signal. So given this question, how, how well can one discriminate different sounds in child-directed versus adult-directed speech? Um, if caregivers aim to promote sound learning, they should pronounce sounds that are different in a very distinct manner. So um, the distance between sounds that are different should be greater in child-directed than adult-directed speech. It turns out that this has received some attention in the baby literature. Um, but uh, what we did here was have a sort of a big data approach in which we took the whole, all of the sounds of Japanese that we could find in the corpus. So the way we did this was with a wonderful code uh, developed by Thomas Schatz um, uh, using the machine ABX task, which some of you might uh, know because I think Emmanuel Dupu continues to use it in the zero speech resource. The way it works is actually like an ABX task that you would present someone else. Um, in which you're going to take syllables from the running speech. So for instance, here we have candidate syllables are B and B, these two sounds, B and B, these two syllables differ only in the vowel. So we take these syllables and we assign them to the A, B or X position, okay? So for instance, perhaps in this particular trial, uh, one token of B goes into the A category one token of uh, the other token of bay goes into the x category the one for which we don't know its identity and one co uh, token for uh, of b goes in the b category and so what the system needs to do is simply simply to represent this in some aggressive way and then calculate um using dtw um just pairwise acoustic distances between a and x on the one hand and b and x on the other hand and simply return if the distance between A and X, my X being my, the category I, for which I don't know the, the um, actual identity, the distance between A and X is smaller than the distance between uh, B and X, then the system will return that the answer, the, the, um, the token, the mystery token X belongs to the category A. Um, in this particular case, that such a response would be correct if they actually find the bigger distance between B and X, uh, sorry, a uh, smaller distance between B and X and A and X, then it would return B, which in this case would be incorrect. Um, so in a way, this, this machine ABX course, they don't represent how the baby does clustering. We actually don't know how, um, but what's nice about them is that it's a proxy for it that should affect any system regardless of how uh, acquisition is done, any system that actually uses all of the data would, um, would have its learnability reflected by this particular uh, proxy. Don't hesitate to stop me at any point. I invite you, I challenge you to do it. Okay, so what you're seeing here is um, on the x-axis, you see the ABX scores for adult direct speech, on the y-axis, you see the ABX scores for child-directed speech, and each one of these represents uh, an, um, an oval covering 95% of the data for a given contrast. So to give an example, um, for instance, this oval here corresponds to the contrast between T and M. So that would be syllables that are identical, except for this particular um, difference, so T versus me, for instance. 
and that's a difference in which only the, the consonant is different. Now, if parents were actually promoting learnability, were making sound classification easier, then we should see most of the mass here above the diagonal, because the diagonal actually shows us that the discriminability scores for adult directed and child directed speech are basically the same. When we test this statistically, we actually find that the opposite is true. Um, and it, this is particularly obvious, the, the further you go up this um, discriminability uh, continuum, uh, these sounds are clearly less discriminable um, in child direct speech than adult direct speech. And so this was really surprising for us uh, at the time, and it was the first um, uh, exhaustive test of this hypothesis, uh, but clearly suggests that parents are not trying to um, arti hyper articulate to make these sounds more distinct when they're talking to their children. So this one unfortunately comes as a, as a no. It's not the case that child direct speech actually uh, helps uh, classification of sounds. Um, in the next study, we look at words. So now we try to do the same. So we'll also use our ABX task, but now instead of defining it at the level of syllables that are minimally different in just one sound, we'll define it at the level of words. And so sometimes the ABX um, items we'll have are really easy, things like poo versus yeah, that sounds pretty um, distinct, but sometimes it, they might be um, um, uh, closer to each other and therefore more different, more difficult to tell apart. Okay, so in this next study, we still assume perfect cementation into words, so we still have this this acoustic representation that have be, has been cut at the right places to cut the words out from the from the spoken stream, but we no longer assume perfect recognition of all sounds. And so we ask, how well can you discriminate um, between different words? And so the intuition is the same. If, if caregivers aim to promote word learning, they should pronounce words distinctly. Okay. Um, and so basically, this is exactly the same as before. We're measuring, we're not measuring actual, we're not implementing learning with a specific model. We, we are actually measuring a proxy of discriminability that should affect learning regardless of which particular theory one has as to um, how babies learn uh, words. And I'd be happy to come back to this, but I think for this audience, it might be a little bit um, too specific. Uh, but you can just believe me when I say that I'm not just selling you something that's that's more abstract. It really is, it should be the case that it affects um, learning regardless, or re it reflects learning regardless of the algorithm one uses for learning. Okay, so we are setting up our ABX task the same as before, except that instead of using syllables, we're actually using whole words, but it works exactly the same. We derive acoustic representations, we measure the distance between pairs of, um, of items, and then depending on the distance between um, the A and X pair versus B and X pair, um, we can return an A or B classification, which could be right or could be wrong. Okay, as before, we split up the results been, depending on whether we include onomatopoeia like choo 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 or not. Um, when we include in onomatopoeia, we actually uh, surprisingly find that caregivers are less clear. So their words are less distinct from each other when they are talking child-directed speech, when they're talking to their child versus when they're talking to an adult. And this is significant. When we take out the onomatopoeia, unfortunately, they're still the same. Um, some of you might not find it surprising. You might find that this is the, this is a, uh, it fits well with the results we found at the, uh, at the sound level. But given the first experiment I mentioned, where we found that words, at, le at least given their surface representation, were more distinct with each other, we had one effect going in one direction, one effect going in the other direction. And these results show us that, the, that when you put the two effects together, you still find actually a benefit for using adult directed rather than child directed speech. Okay, so, so far we found one point for child directed speech and two points against. Uh, we now turn at trying to discover abstract, um, uh, using an abstract representation to discover um, words. So in this case, you might think this is super easy because now I give you the actual, the written form and all I do is remove the word boundaries. And your task is to find that boo is repeated in boo and in pickaboo. Okay? 
So basically, the, go the goal here is discovering these um, word-like units. Um, so I'm, for, the for the time being, I'm going to assume that uh, in this particular representation, all the sounds are, are recognized perfectly, even though I know that that's not quite right, because we saw that sounds are harder to uh, pick up on chattering speech. But for now, we'll assume that they're represented perfectly. And so the question we ask is, how easily can we find words in running speech that's represented in these text-like units as if it was orthographic, except that we just remove the word boundaries. The intuition is, as, as before, if caregivers aim to promote word learning, then they should make words easily discoverable, and more easily discoverable when they're talking to their child versus when they're talking to an adult. And this one we thought we should, should come out because as we saw at the very beginning, one of the things we see are these sort of phrases that get repeated when people talk to children. And so it should be, this repetition maybe should help. One problem we have here is that before we could look at these proxies. And the nice thing about these proxies is that um, they're theory general. It doesn't matter how you um, think that acquisition works. The moment acquisition actually relies on this data, then um, the, the learning process should be affected by these uh, differences of, um, for instance, sound representation we found. Unfortunately, for this case, there is no, or I haven't come up with a theory general proxy. If you have, I'd be happy to hear about it. Um, and so what we did here is actually implement learning models. So this is one case and we have specific learning models and our conclusion actually might uh, is limited by that because someone might come up with a model next year which does some, something differently. Um, and so our conclusions would be uh, curfewed by, by this. Fortunately for us, there has been a lot of people looking at this, uh, looking at uh, basically unsupervised word segmentation. And the basic process of this is you start with, um, with a representation that might be orthographic and might be written uh, the way that we write. And then you first phonologize it. So you turn it into something that looks like text, but where each character actually represents a phoneme, a sound, an independent sound. Then we remove the word boundaries and that's the input to the learning process. And so what the unsupervised learning model has to do is cut this up into word-like units. And so this can be done in many different ways, but regardless of which way it's done, you end up with a stream that has the same number of elements as the input stream, except that now it has hypothesized word boundaries, for instance here, spaces where the system thinks that there should be a break. By comparing across the uh, output of the model and the uh, original representation that has spaces where words, where boundaries actually were, uh, we can calculate precision and recall. And then I'm always going to show you F scores. Um, I'm not, I, I'm not hiding anything by doing that because it's very confusing for many people. But in this particular task, precision and recall are actually correlated. So there's no. Um, there's no trade-off between them in this particular task. I can, I can talk more about that if people are interested. Okay, so that's the general strategy, the, the general way that the task is set up. Um, in this particular paper, we looked at a, a wide range of algorithms that had been proposed and for which we could re-implement the code. We had two super dumb strategies, really stupid, but you know, maybe babies at the beginning are not doing something really intelligent. And so uh, the simplest strategy is to consider every every utterance to be a word, so you don't put any boundaries in the middle, um, or to consider every syllable as a word. We also had some that we call sublexical. So these are uh, bottom-up strategies where you try to find places in, in the sequence where you can cut up, for instance, because um, you find that the transitional probabilities are very low, so that's likely a boundary. And we had smarter or top-down strategies that we call lexical, where the objective is actually to find minimal recombinable units. For instance, um, we have a few of these, including um, a representation of adapter grammar, um, where utterances are defined as, um, as um, sequences of words, words are defined as sequences of, of uh, phones, of, uh, of sounds, um, and the goal of the adapt programmer is to actually find the lexicon that best explains the input. Um, 
what I'm showing you here are the results for uh, the the y-axis shows the the um, the token F score, um, and on the x-axis you see a division in terms of the types of algorithms that we looked at, uh, separating the baseline. So these are the stupid ones, sublexical, the ones that are sort of bottom up, trying to find places where you can cut, and lexical where you're trying to actually find units uh, top down. So we see things like lexical tends to do better than the other two. Um, but most importantly to our purpose, what we tend to find is that um, they are very similar, but if anything, in several of these cases, we do see a, a benefit for child-directed speech. Um, so two cases that are unclear, one case where we see an adult-directed speech uh, advantage, and four cases where we see child-directed speech advantage. So um, this is, of course, limited because now you could come up with more algorithms, and so we don't. We also don't know which ones babies use. But if they use at least some of these, uh, they could have an advantage by learning and words in an unsupervised form um, from child-directed as opposed to adult-directed speech. Um, by the way, this is one of the studies that we were able to replicate in other work. So I'd be happy to tell you about them if you're interested, including in French. So for now, we'll count this as a win. So it turns out that you can learn, uh, discover in a, an unsupervised way words uh, from a concrete representation, uh, sorry, from an abstract representation better from child-directed than adult-directed speech. And so we now turn to the final uh, experiment in which instead of discovering words from this orthography-like representation, we'll try to discover words from the actual acoustic signal. And so, for instance, this is the same thing that the boo, peekaboo, and yeah we saw before. Uh, and the goal is to find boo in peekaboo. So this is the experiment that's closest to what babies actually do, because we don't assume anything except that you can pick up on what's speech and what's noise and throw away the noise. Um, and so the question here is how easily can you find words in running speech? And the intuition is if caregivers try to make word learning easier, then they should make words more discoverable. Here we have the same problem as before. We cannot measure a proxy that will apply to any kind of learning paradigm. We have to actually implement a model. And we're less lucky because we only found one, um, one algorithm that we can actually reproduce in the lab. Um, and so this one is called MODIS, uh, Motive Discovery. Um, the way it works is represented in, I'll, I'll show you, I'll set you through. The input to the system is actually the acoustic representation of the sound, or um, basically in MFCCs. Um, um, and what the system does is actually it starts with a buffer that's that's uh, that's clean. It doesn't have anything in the bu the buffer, and it has a, a, it will start uh, storing uh, items in a long term memory. So let's imagine that it has uh, a system, a, a bit of uh, speech, a, a bit of signal that comes into this buffer. And so in this buffer, if it finds bits that are similar to each other within the buffer or bits that are um, similar to other things in, in the buffer, um, then it might try a bigger version of the same um, to, to create a bigger motif that includes the bits that seem to be repeated. Um, and then if, uh, if that's too short, then it gets discarded. Um, and if it's not too short, then it will be added to the dictionary. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, this, uh, this represents how items enter in the long-term memory, um, but it's a little bit strange to think about words in this acoustic form um, and to think about how to uh, check whether the algorithm was right. So let me give you an example of how the uh, evaluation works. Uh, in this particular case, we're just going to evaluate the segmentation. Imagine that this, um, this signal actually comes from a center where someone was saying, anyway, elephants are nowhere elephants. That's a little bit funny. Um, where we have these two sections, elephants and elephants, which are very similar, but not quite the same. Um, and they are aligned to these bits of the signal. Um, if the system actually finds 
these two tokens and, the, and classify them as being in one same and the same cluster, cluster 24, uh, we will count the first one as being correct. The reason being that uh, this, this uh, segmentation corresponds to actual segmentation into words. We will count the second one as being incorrect because it missed a boundary that's there in the, um, in the original transcription. And we count elephants as correct, even though it was put in the same cluster as elephants, which should not have been the same cluster. So we're kind of being nice, um, allowing clusters to be internally hybrid. We're just going to look at segmentation and seeing whether it gets the boundaries between words right. As before, we're going to calculate token F score um, um, as a measure of, uh, of precision uh, and recall combined. Okay, so these are the results. Um, just so that you you keep them in mind, um, these are results from one of the lexical algorithms that we saw before. Um, and so when you uh, run this, this is so these are results on the uh, on the orthographic representation, which as we saw before, it can have quite good um, token F scores. So we see here about 50%. Um, and these are the results for the um, segmentation of this motif discovery system. And some of you may be thinking, well, but I, I don't get it. Did she forget to do the animation? I didn't forget to do the animation. They really look like that. That's what the graph looks like because the performance is so bad that you basically cannot see the bars. So this was a bit disappointing. Um, we do find uh, we don't find a, um, an advantage for uh, adult for child speech here. If anything, we see a small disadvantage. But in any case, performance is so terrible um, that we didn't know it's unclear what one can conclude. And so we run one more condition. Uh, we call it the, the motif discovery sound condition. What we did here is we kept the timing of the uh, of the items, but instead of using MFCC, so an acoustic representation, we actually used letters. And we had one letter per each frame that uh, the phoneme actually lasted. So this is the way of keeping the segmentation information, but uh, correcting for any kind of mispronunciation. Um, or pronunciation that's kind of messy. So when we do this, we do see a small child directed speech advantage with an overall still pretty terrible kind of um, performance. Nonetheless, um, we can say uh, we, we can say that the result of study five is that child directed speech is not easier to segment when we look at concrete representation, when we when we look at an actual acoustic representation. And the only point where it became a little bit better is when we gave um, when we cheated and we gave the system directly the access to the letters instead of giving them the acoustic representation. So one might ask. Uh, oneself, why is it that um, child direct speech pronunciation is messy? And everything here is in parentheses because I don't care about this. This is a question about why do parents do this? And parents will be parents. I don't know. Maybe they're trying to do something else. They're trying to engage the child. They're trying to connect with the child and they're not trying to teach language. So I don't particularly work on this question. Uh, I don't know why child directed speech pronunciation is messy. But what I do care about is the fact that even though they are learning from this messy signal, kids seem to be acquiring language nonetheless. And so there's a, two possibilities that I see. This, this discussion will be very, very short. Two things that might save babies from this messy signal. One possibility is that they actually exploit not just the acoustic, but something else that's not represented in this talk at all. For instance, learning of meanings. Perhaps when they learn meanings, they can um, capitalize on other things, on uncorrelated um, benefits. And this synergy allows them to get over the fact that the acoustic signal is actually quite messy. Another possibility, which I find quite interesting, is that perhaps uh, infants have access to their articulations. And they, uh, if you have children, you probably have noticed that they tend to babble a lot 
And so uh, this is one way in which they could learn things. They could actually um, uh, study the relationship between their actual motor gestures, which they kind of control, and the uh, acoustic um, consequences of that. And this may give them a kind of internal abstract representation that they can use to get over the messy signal that they find in their environments. And that's why I was excited when I saw that Menon Dupu started his Zero Speech Challenge 2019, in which um, he was getting closer to production. So uh, with that, I will conclude. I know I showed you a lot of data and very little discussion, um, but I really think that this is the first stage of a very long journey where um, a lot need, more needs to be done to understand more how babies learn language in these uh, messy and variable conditions and how we can uh, perhaps uh, harness these uh, insights to try to make machines that learn as good as uh, humans do. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank my amazing collaborators in this work um, and the funding agencies. And thank you all for your very quiet attention. Um, I hope you're still there and listening. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. OK, thanks a lot, Alex. I'm sure everybody's still on board. So yeah, it's time for questions. So if anyone uh, wants to unmute his mic and maybe uh, ask any question. Uh, I think we are not too many, so we can just uh, speak directly. So maybe I, I, I can start. Or oh, Andre, do you want to ask a question? No. Okay, so maybe I can just ask a question. Um, so, so you, you you have data set from from several language and and several cultural and level of education. I mean, how how easy it is to man to manage a, a very broad set of data sets, and also do you observe some key differences, uh, maybe in terms of I don't know level of education or even just uh, just the country or something that you briefly mentioned at the beginning. Yeah, well, handling large databases is really not easy, that's for sure. Um, one thing that has made my work easier recently is to standardize the system that we use to collect the data. So before, people used to collect data with all kinds of um, techniques, and but very often in, in kind of a laboratory situation, which is necessary to have good acoustic signal. Um, and now I've moved away from that, from all that, so in the last five years, I've been collecting almost exclusively um, data using day-long recording devices. So these are little uh, tiny recorders that the child wears on a t-shirt throughout the whole day. Um, and that also means like a shift between uh, in the way that, that you conceive of these data. So instead of uh, trying to capture every little thing that people say, you have a very global view of how much does the child talk and how much do people around the child talk. Um, and so we do things like, now we do things like, um, instead of doing um, manual annotation on the, in the lab, we develop uh, systems to do uh, uh, basically supervised annotation of some things that we care about. And for things that machines cannot do, we actually started using um, citizen science platforms like Zooniverse. And so we have a lot of data annotated like that. As to differences, um, this is a topic I, I work a lot on, uh, the question of whether there are differences across cultures. And you also mentioned differences across um, education levels. Uh, and um, I can tell you that differences across cultures are very, very large in terms of how much people talk to children. Uh, they're really stunning, and now I've seen them in a, in a, a few different uh, sets of corpora, particularly with this method of the child wearing a device, which is great because you can be pretty sure that people get used to being recorded because they are recording, you know, like maybe four days in a row. As to differences as a function of socioeconomic status or, or how educated parents are, I, I am less convinced right now by the data. I was really convinced maybe four years ago, five years ago, but I think we've, we're starting to see results that don't seem to align with that. And there's there's a slight pocket uh, of, of data that seems to suggest that 
the difference is there's a there's a people talk more more to children when they're really really highly educated so basically us <laughs> compared to everyone else but if you look at someone who finished a college degree so something like 16 years of education versus someone who finished just high school so 12 years of education then that difference actually is not very big so i don't know if that answers your question yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but um so would there be some goal at the end to to use your tool also to get some feedback about what would be like good practice or like trying to to detect something that could be detrimental for, for the children or is it like just pure research results at the end any feedback on the actual uh, way the education system or even parents uh, uh, should in some sense behave no we, we definitely think about that a lot actually right now there's um for the last few years there has been a move to bet in early education like uh, in uh, infant cognitive stimulation as a way to improve academic outcomes so my group is part of the groups that are trying to get evidence on this to make sure that that basically governments are putting their money in the right place um, and that they're giving that, that these interventions that try to get parents to talk more, for instance, are actually effective and, um, and uh, uh, appropriate. And so to give you an example, I'm collaborating with uh, researchers in Australia and who have done an intervention in the Solomon Islands um, where they basically explain the fact that, that most evidence right now suggests that if you talk more to your child, then your child's uh, language will be better and their academic performance will be better. But what's interesting is that they're doing this in, um, in a, basically in a farming community, in a traditional farming community, where there is school, but, they, but the society is basically set up in a very different way from ours. And so, um, Unfortunately for us, for us, COVID will not allow us to gather the um, data to check whether the intervention worked. Uh, but one possibility was that it wouldn't work because some of the advice we're uh, giving today, for instance, um, cognitively stimulating the child, talking all, a lot to the child, might be easy to implement for us because uh, parents tend to be the people who take care of the child the most. But that m might not be the case in other cultures where actually caregiving is shared with siblings and uh, grandparents and so on and so forth. So mm. we're looking for that evidence, but we're also kind of looking for evidence that maybe there are other interventions that work better in these cases. Um, and so we're definitely thinking about this. It's, we don't design the interventions most of the time. We accompany people who design and roll out interventions. We just do the measurement. Um, yeah, that's, that's it for now. Okay, it's, a, it's a very, very satisfying work, I guess. I mean, it's very nice. Uh, anyone would have uh, some question? I know everybody's very shy, but it's uh, the last chance. Well, maybe Jamal. I have a question, yeah. Jamal. Yes, Jamal, we hear you. Yeah. You mentioned in your presentation this F measure, and you said that there is no compromise or trade off between um, precision and recall, which is a little bit puzzling. Can you comment just a little bit about it? Yeah, I know, I know it's really puzzling, but I can show you. I mean, the, every, every paper I send in, the reviewers are like, <laughs> what? That's impossible. And I show them the curve, and they're like, there must be something wrong. <laughs> You must have renamed precision as recall. They're not perfectly correlated, but by and large, the way it works is remember that you you have a stream of phonemes of sounds and you of text, and you're trying to cut in different places. And so this is really not the same as when you're trying to classify. And so when you classify, you might have a category that has more things, and therefore it has a bigger recall, um, but it has lower precision because you put together everything. Here, since you have you you have a fixed number of places where you can cut things, when you cut things wrong, that both means that the the tokens that you pulled out um, correctly uh, um, from the original one, so a, a higher recall, tend to also be the ones that have higher precision. So it has to do with this this uh, this constraint. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. So, any other questions? Thanks. Thank you,
So if there's no question, I think we will stop here. And uh, so, our uh, Cordelia. Yeah, I had a question. It's more high yes. level, but basically, did you feel if you would use other inputs, for example, vision, that could help, or is that completely unreasonable? Because that's kind of what we are currently looking at: is combining audio or speech and vision, and it seems to be helping. And I think if you just look at how people learn, it must help, right? Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think that that uh, multimodal learning is probably one way in which we can get out of this mess. Uh, because clearly the acoustics, just the, the, the signal is not going to help us. Um, and so one of the, this is something that we're exploring with Marvin Dabshan, who's a, P, a PhD student um, co-supervisor at Manon Dupont as well. But if you if you have some ideas, we'd be happy to hear about them. Yeah, it would be very good to discuss further because I think it's super interesting. And I think babies, they also develop the visual system at the same time as the audio system. So I think there must be some correlation, right? I mean, I don't know exactly what, but it's pretty clear that they're not taking, turning off the vision and using the audio by themselves. Well, thanks, Cordelia. It's indeed a very interesting question. Um, okay, so we can probably stop here. Thank you a lot, uh, Alex, for this uh, very nice talk for me. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. It's always and don't a bit difficult, but uh, I'd be happy to hear questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's probably very interesting for a lot of people here in Prairie and as well outside Prairie. Uh, so thanks everyone for participating. Uh, the next uh, colloquium will most probably be early September. We'll tell you mm -hmm. more about this. And uh, with this, um, I think we can stop. Thanks a lot, uh, Alex, once again. Um, Hi, everyone. Thanks, Alex. everyone. Thanks for attending. Bye, Alex. Thanks. Thanks so much. Bye, Alex. Mm -hmm.